The Business of Agriculture is brought to you by Land Trust. Have you heard how landowners are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use? Millions of outdoor recreators seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Landowners are partnering with the Recreation Access Network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit LandTrust.com slash BOA, as in Business of Agriculture, to learn more. That's LandTrust.com slash BOA. Well, greetings and welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason. You already knew that. I got a great show for you today. We're talking about tree fruit. Specifically, we're talking about apples. You know, in 220 or how many episodes of the Business of Agriculture, I don't think we've done anything on apples. That all changed because on January 4th, I am going to be a speaker at Wilbur Ellis's Tree Fruit Conference. That's right, in Yakima, Washington. I'm going to be up there speaking to them. Not about apples because I'm not the expert. I'm going to be talking about the business of agriculture, marketplace influences, outlook, insights, the usual things that I do. But I thought, man, these guys are smart and I want to learn the world about apples and bring along my listeners and viewers. So I've got Dave Robison. Dave is the owner of Robison Orchards, Inc. Robison Orchards, Inc. up there in the great state of Washington. Nathan Spires, who is by Nate, is the horticultural specialist with Wilbur Ellis. He covers a whole bunch of these acres of orchards that grow apples. We're going to hear about the industry within the industry of agriculture. We're going to hear about apple production, what it takes, what all goes on. You know, they have tremendous gross proceeds from an acre of apple trees. They also spend a whole bunch of money producing those apples. We're going to talk about the entire production and the process. And then also we're going to talk about compliance because Dear listener, maybe you are in the canned food business. Maybe you sell farm machinery. Do you realize that every product they produce generally goes straight to human consumption? So there's a lot of rules and regulations they have to work through. We're going to hear about all of that. And we're going to talk about what's happening in the world of apples. Welcome to the show, Nate and Dave. Thanks. Good to be here. All right. Mr. Robison, real quickly. Um, What's the story there, Robinson Orchards, Inc.? You're uh, about a 60-year-old guy. You've probably been in this your whole life. Is this a, is this a, was this grandpa's place? Did you strike on your own? Give me the background, Robinson Orchards. Well, you guessed pretty good. I'm, I'm 61. And uh, as a matter of fact, my grandfather did start uh, back on this, on our home place here. He started in the late 50s. My father took over in the early 70s and uh next year will be my 40th year and this so traditional farming my son lives in the original farmhouse with his family and i'm in the process of hopefully being able to retire someday and turn it over to him so but we're just a small family farm totally what's that mean hey what's what small family farm mean in the world of apples well, in the world of Washington State, it means we're farming, a, for us, 120 acres. Um, Washington State's very interesting. I'm pretty sure we have the biggest farms in the world for apples here. There, there are companies that have 8, 10, maybe 12,000 acres. And Jake, my son, and I are plugging away on 120. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know when I spoke with Nate and doing some preparation, there's this huge uh, operation up there that's like, what, Nate, 10 or 12,000 acres, and it's owned, of all things, by the Ontario Teachers uh, Retirement Fund, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's it's around a 9,000 acre piece. So that's correct. Um, so obviously that's not owned by a private individual or being operated by a man and his son. Uh, and by the way, Nate, Horticultural specialist at Will Borellis. Uh, give us a little background. Will Borellis, for you, dear listeners and viewers, is an agricultural retailer. It's a it's a a, a company that makes the all gets all the stuff the, that the farm operations need. Give me the background there, Nate. Yeah, agricultural supply company for uh, uh, over 100 years. Actually, we're on our 100th year, rolling into our 101st year next year. So pretty proud of that as a company. 
um, been around a long time. We we supply obviously uh, chemicals for agricultural problems, and we supply fertilizer. We supply uh, various sundries for for the supplies needed, whether it be you know ladders, loppers, uh, all of the other hardware and things that go into there, whether it be trellis for orchards and those things as well. We, uh, we operate through uh, a lot of different branches here in Washington State. There's probably roughly 10 branches that we operate out of in the tree fruit division. We also have an, an ag division that works in the row crop market. But uh, we have quite a few trained individuals that do field work and go out and consult with, uh, with someone like Dave. Um, one of one of the guys that works with Dave up in the Chelan, Washington area has been there a long time. Uh, Ken's been in the business for, I think, 40 plus years as well. And he's he's been around a long time. So we're proud of the, the amount of uh, tenure that we have with our staff. We have a lot of staff that has 20 plus years of experience and we and we have a lot of new staff rolling in, too. That's kind of what my. Uh, forte and what coming to Wilbur Ellis has meant for me is working with those young folks and starting to transition them into a career in the in agriculture, specifically in orchards and and working with fruit growers here in Washington State. Uh, Wilbur Ellis does a lot of of other things within our growers. We've expanded and and kind of adapted as we've had to with folks to help with the problems that they have, whether that's probe schedule for watering, uh, for scheduling with water, for for the fertility, we have our TNS system that takes care of fertility and we break down, uh, you know, fertilizer needs and nutrient needs for trees and for, for crops annually with our folks. And then we have, you know, a lot of other stuff with our compliance. We have folks that go out and work with, uh, with organic certifications for our growers that are organic growers. Uh, we work with those folks on their compliance for making sure that they're getting everything done for the food safety programs that they're involved in, whether they're uh, Global Gap or whether they're FISMA or whatever whatever program that they're on. Our, our compliance team goes out and works with those folks and crosses the T's and dots the I's for them, helps them do uh, audit, audits on, on site, help them to make sure that they're complying with the, with the regulatory stuff that they need. And in today's marketplace, it's really, it's a real struggle for growers because there's so many things that they're bombarded with, with all of the work that they have to do and all of the rules that they have to live by. You know, our compliance team goes out and sets down, goes through an audit with a, with a grower like Dave. And they say, hey, you know, these are the things that are new this year. These are the things that we have to uh, to work on. And we'll, we'll do that audit and help them get in front of that. So when the compliance team comes out uh, or when they're audited by the sales side of it for the marketing company that works with them, hopefully we've already got all those things crossed and fixed for them. And, and if they have issues, a lot of times, hey, we're very fortunate. Guys are starting to understand the food safety thing more. It is it is a lot of work, but we're getting really good at knowing what we've got to do. And we do a really good job as an industry, making sure that we've done a good job promoting, you know, safe food for the, for the world. Hey, Nate, I was going to ask you a question here, but um, did you think that we were just going to make this a solo podcast? And you were going to talk the whole time. Cause I still haven't gotten back to Dave. I got all these questions for him. Anyway, no, we're going to get to a bunch going. of those things about organic and about compliance and about the different things you offer real quickly. By the way, dear listener, also Will Burrell's is not just in the specialty crop business. They are a, a agricultural product supply house for uh, uh, what a dozen States or something. Actually, all over the U.S., we, okay. we have we have people in. Yeah, there's probably more than a dozen, but I, I don't know the actual number, David. Yeah. So this is just this one is because they are in that area. Remember, Washington State, you think about them for wheat and then you got this tremendous amount of hops. There's like 90 percent of the hops that there are grown in the United States happen within a stone's throw of downtown Yakima, is my understanding. And then you've got the fruit like cherries and pears and, and apples. OK, so we're going to talk about what you do to help Dave, but let's talk some more about what Dave's operation does. 120 acres is a hell of a lot of apple trees. I've got three on my farm in Indiana, and they produce a lot of apples. At least they did this last year because we had adequate moisture. So 120 acres when they're doing it commercially because you're trying to make a living at it, you're producing a boatload of apples. So I want to ask about all those kinds of things um, on your operation. First off, you said it's just me and my son. Is it just you and your son? Because that's still a lot of trees to cover with two people. No, you use hired folks folks, right? Yes, we do. We have 10 year round employees. And then we are involved. This was our fourth year in the H2A program. And for harvest this year, we brought up uh, 20, 24 guys from Mexico. Yeah. So to the listener who doesn't remember, I did a podcast about this a year or so ago about uh, about the labor issue. H2A is the program we bring here uh, people for production, agriculture in particular and doing uh, uh, 
work it's kind of seasonal but also they can stay for a, a couple of years if they keep going to different places i think so your people come in work for you 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 know it's funny you're saying we're just a small farm here but you've got 10 employees you know there's a lot of small businesses that don't have 10 employees full-time you're using 10 full-time employees to do that and then you're doing uh, even seasonal work what's it look like around robinson farms um you're you're not doing the exact same thing on every acre because you do different varieties, I'm guessing. And also you couldn't have all those trees be at the same age because then they time out. Don't you have to cycle them out and plant them on different schedules? Can I talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, first of all, our 120 acres is, is spread over four or five locations here on, on the home place. We're out in the middle of nowhere at 25 mile Creek, um, have as much concern about bears and cougar as deer, but most of our acreage is on the other side of Chelan, about 25 miles away. Mostly talk about apples because 85% of our production is apples. We've worked really hard in the last seven or eight years to um, change varieties. The first thing we did was we, we tried to identify which blocks we thought we could graft to a, a different variety on top and leave the rootstock in the ground. And um, at the time, you guys are probably very familiar with Honeycrisp. We grafted a, a lot of orchards to Honeycrisp. They've been very, very successful. Then we planted some Honeycrisp, especially here at 25 Mile Creek, not quite so successfully. Our, our the main part of this orchard was originally planted in 1908. So it had decades of, um, I call it soil abuse. And I just picked the wrong rootstock when I planted. Uh, Honeycrisp is not a tree that grows very fast. So it's been a struggle here. Now here, to the person that doesn't know, okay, uh, you know, in my part of the world, Johnny Appleseed walked around with a frying pan on his head and, and stuck apple seeds in the ground, allegedly. Um, we come a long way from that. Out in your part of the world, we've been growing apples for a long time because the climate and the, all the reasons for that. You mentioned sticking bare root stuff in. When I stick a bare root tree in, so I'm, I'm sitting there saying, in about four or five years, because that's when that tree is going to finally start producing fruit of any commercial viability, I'm hoping that I'm putting the right tree in now that that type of apple is going to be in demand four and five years from now. Right, Dave? Yep, that's right. Uh, just a side note there to plant an acre of ground, a, a competitive acre of ground now to get to that fourth fourth year costs us about $55,000 an acre. Now that's if you already own the ground. It includes um, trellis, uh, drip irrigation, under tree irrigation. And after the block starts coming in production, we put over tree irrigation for, for cooling. Once you have that much money in, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to try to cut any corners but it's tremendously expensive so we better pick the right one to begin with yeah so you said okay i'm gonna start getting commercial a, a viable crop by four to five years right yes okay and i'm gonna have 55 grand invested in that acre of apple trees in that four years before i even get my first real commercially viable apple right correct okay yep. now going back to our man nate during that time, now he's he's going out sticking in bare root. Uh, and how big are those trees, by the way, Dave? Like a couple feet tall? No, no, they're probably between six and seven feet most of the time. Lots of ways to do it, but the most common would be buying from a nursery. It'd be six or seven feet tall. And so they're already a year or two, two years old by that time, aren't they? Yes, they're usually two. Okay. And then you also mentioned that you went into a grove and apparently those trees were getting past their prime and you grafted. So for the listener at home that has no idea that didn't take horticulture 101 at Purdue, tell us what that means. Well, we, we cut the tree off down, oh, let's say three feet from the ground. And we, we take the, the kind of apple we want and um, match up the, the cambium layer of the bark, which is the part that's alive. Um, we do that in the, in the spring and then paint it with a special paint so it doesn't dry out. And, and we take that little stick that's uh, 
big as that pen there and and match up those cambiums and then and then paint it and then um if things go right and they usually do honestly it's highly successful on on apples if things go right then those could grow well they could grow three or four feet in the first year so you, you get back in production a lot faster mm. and it's tremendously cheaper because you don't have all that uh well trees are very expensive to buy yeah you're going so you're essentially if i got a if i got a acre of trees that are sort of past their prime i can go out and i'm essentially or or we don't want that variety more and i stick the new hot variety in there and i graft it i use the roots that are already established i use the infrastructure established and then i'm getting uh the the new fancy apple using the old apple tree roots right correct yeah. By the way, dear listener, I'm not the expert here, but the cambium layer is essentially the outer half inch of the of the tree. That's where all the xylem and phloem and all the sugars go up and down. So going back to bio 108 right there. But uh, anyway, and God knows if you want to kill a tree, all you got to do is cut that outer half inch, because uh, if you girdle it, it'll kill that tree. Is that right, Dave? That's right. And That's we hard. actually use that as a technique to slow them down, but you don't want to overdo it. That's right. Nate, uh, he said something there. He said this farm was, what do we say? The soil was abused. You know, in my part of the world, if you till too much, if it's slopey ground and you let it erode, you do fall tillage and let it get blown away or washed away. If you don't keep your fertility up, um, maybe you've done some bad practices. Uh, out there was too wet. You compacted it. This is the kind of ground you're going over multiple times a year, though, to say grow corn and soybeans. What the hell would happen to an apple orchard? How would I abuse that soil from an agronomic standpoint? Because it's not as though I'm just raping it, taking crops off it like soybeans and corn and then not putting the nitrogen back. It seems different to me. Apples are just these happy little trees. They don't need all this fertilizer and all this stuff, do they? Oh, yeah, actually, actually, they do. So we get you know, we get a lot of leaching. We have uh, I'm going to guess that Dave's soil. Uh, I haven't pulled a sample ever at Dave's place, but I'm going to guess Dave's probably working with uh, either a sandy loam or, or a light, a little bit lighter soil on the banks. Maybe it's a, a, a light clay, but we get a lot of leaching in that soil. We get, uh, you know, we get a lot of snow. Dave gets a lot of snow up at 25 mile Creek. So we can move a lot of nutrients through a profile. So we're replenishing that quite often. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to speak for Dave, but I think some of the stuff you might've been talking about is back in like 1908, the practices and the products that we use were not, they were nowhere near the products that we use today. We had a lot of lead arsenic. We had a lot of, you know, even DDT, those products. So uh, land is the one thing that's really hard to replace, right? So you, you're picking up land and you got to use what you've got when you're doing stuff. So I'm assuming that some of those old, old back into the early 1900s was some of the practices that were done just horticulturally that were, those were the practices at the time. That was what everybody did. Um, that's where, you know, working with our TNS, like I said earlier, we come in and we do a lot of soil sampling. We do a lot of nutrient sampling with teeth, uh, with tree leaves and, and tissue samples, uh, looking at what we've got going on there. And we, and we will analyze stuff very well, try to figure out what we need. I did speak to the probe schedule and the irrigation. One of the things that we try to do is we definitely try to monitor our water use a little better. So we're not actually pushing those nutrients past the root zone a little bit different in the tree fruit market than it is in the in the corn and soybean market where you know our roots are quite a bit deeper but we also you know pick up a lot more irrigation we're watering quite frequently through the growing season you know to push to push the nutrients and to push the growth in those trees you know they're gonna they're gonna run pretty hard all year so question yeah that's that's interesting by the way several things you said there there's a lot of folks that don't know ag and i've got my neighbors come out here at my phoenix house now uh, for the winter operating from here Hey, David, you're a farm guy. Is it true we're putting all these nasty chemicals from Monsanto? They, they don't call it the right name. I said, that's not a company anymore, you know. Monsanto on our food? I said, uh, yeah, we use some herbicides around the farm. Yeah, well, you know, in the old days, we didn't do that. I'm like, bullshit. Do you realize what kind of stuff we did 100 years ago? They put nasty stuff out there, as you just talked about. You used the word arsenic. The average person's yeah. like, oh, that's poison. Yeah, we used it in the orchards of America. And we used <laughs> Dave, yeah. even since you were you're, you're the elder statesman here, you touched stuff and you're you said you've been at it 40 years. You touched stuff your first year of farming or growing up around there that you'd be like, hey, kids, stay away from that now. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. And, and I just think the general public is about 30 years behind what we're actually 
doing. I mean, there is just no comparison whatsoever. The products we put on now and, and what we used to do, and these new products are not as easy to use. They're, yeah, they're expensive, but as part of what my, my field men, Nate mentioned, uh, Ken Jenkins, the field men I have with Wilbur Ellis, we actually played football together in, in high school. But what, what he does is work very close with me and my son for, for timing and those kind of things. Yeah. Because the, the new products, you just don't put them on and everything's good. Um, and yeah, when I started, there were some pretty serious uh, products. I have no experience whatsoever with anybody ever getting sick or anything. But it, looking back, it sure sounds like they were bad now. And some yeah. of them sure smelled bad. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've touched some, I've touched some stuff, uh, that, uh, when I was growing up that I'm, I don't want to, I'm glad we're not using that anymore. Um, on that $55,000 per acre before you ever get your first apple, um, how much that is product like you're talking about from a uh, Will Barellis, how much of that is continually, cause you've got to really nourish that, that rootstock, right? You've got to really get that tree growing because if it's like corn or any other crop, you give that a bad day in its first six months, you're probably screwed for the next six years, I'm guessing. So you really want to take good care of it early on. Is that when you're, I mean, is it, is it, is that when it's almost like handling a baby? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And we've been involved in the soil sampling program with Wilbur Ellis for, well, a, a long, long time. We take soil samples on these, on new blocks two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. And um, we then we take that information and we put on blends in the spring and fall, if necessary, just specifically what the samples show we need. And and we also do fertigation through the drip irrigation during yeah. the summer. Um, we just want to push these trees as, as hard as we can. And I just want to make sure I don't miss this because Nate mentioned it, but the the probe schedule service that they have that's what the program's called but um i don't know the technical part there's one thing good about wilbur ellis these kind of products they they completely service and take care of i'm a small farmer i don't have time for it yeah but i have got these soil moisture monitors i think i have 11 of them now and specifically with honey crisp which is our biggest crop mm -hmm. um if we can keep the soil moisture at say 60 or 70% of field capacity, uh, field capacity is when the soil is a hundred percent full of water. And if you go farther than that, it's, it gets waterlogged. Yeah. So we try to keep that uh, rate at 60 or 70% of field capacity on Honeycrisp, which is fairly risky in that if you lose your water supply, and you're at 60%, you don't have much time to react. We we had a big forest fire here this year on the home place. It's almost all honey crisp, and we lost our mile of eight inch PVC. It all burned up or 90% of it. So we were really struggling. But with again, with honey crisp, I'm not talking about growing trees, I'm talking about fruit quality. If we can keep those trees on the dry side. It's just, it's, it's a huge difference in how many uh, packs we can get out of a bin of apples. A bin is about a thousand pounds. And um, financially, it's just night and day. It's one, I think it's probably the biggest change I've made in the last seven years that affects my financial bottom line. And that that is watching that soil moisture with specifically the honey crisp, although it, it can help a lot of other uh, products. And, and when those things break down, I, I call Wilbur Ellis and, and they come fix them. So um, I'm not a techie person. This Zoom is as far as I go. Hey, we should have forgot. We forgot to tell Dave that I already have a sponsor for this, and he's making it the Wilbur Ellis show. But that's all right because I like you guys. Hey, uh, well, Dave, let's uh, let's ask this. Um, he talks a lot about you know getting this product out, and then the money, and then we're going to go back to Dave. But you said when we were prepping for this, Nate, you know people that in the Apple business were on the top of the world financially, and then they went bankrupt. 
Um, yeah. Specialty, and you know, it's happened. I've been a dairy. Obviously, I grew up in the dairy business in 1984 or five. It was 85, I think. They instituted the first dairy buyout because folks like we got too much milk and people are going broke. Why don't you just sell out and the government will give you money to not milk cows? You know, and people did that. So I've seen this boom and bust. And God knows I grew up you know, through the 80s. So I know about busts and I'm not making light of it. I just I've seen it. What happened in specialty crops? Is it more volatile or is it because you can't insure it? What happens with apples that make it, obviously the dollars per acre are pretty damn stupendous, but what else is there about apples? That, do you think it makes it more volatile than corn and beans? Well, there's, there's, you know, environmental factors are always in any part of farming. So we have, uh, we have environmental factors that can come along. One of the things, you know, going back into the late nineties, that was a, a big downturn for the apple industry was, you know, we didn't have very many varieties back then. We had some golden, some reds, some galas, some grannies. And, you know, as the market, as the market went through the process, you know, we started having less, uh, less value into those crops. And then as people started changing and Dave, Dave spoke with this, as people started changing their varieties and they started adding to, you know, the, the difference in, in having, you know, some diversity into their product, um, they started being able to bring some of these newer varieties in and stay on the front edge, if you will, of the economic changes where varieties of apples got to be more valuable. Um, with reds in particular, there's been a big change in the last 15 years here in Washington state where Red Delicious was the number one produced apple in the state. And it was because of what you said earlier. It was it was the region. We have the the area to produce it. And actually, Chelan, where, where Dave's at, was one of the top producing areas for Red Delicious in the state. But as time has changed, the consumer the consumer likes a sexy apple. So when you go to the store, you know the redder the better. If you go out and you have these new club varieties where the taste is a little different, and you know I, I hear this from wine guys all the time about the tannins and the the taste and all the stuff, and they can taste the oak from the barrel. Well, apples we're, we're kind of the same way. We've we started trying to manipulate the genetics of apples to be able to, or, or the strains of apples to be able to have a different flavor. So we're mixing some cultivars. We're finding cultivars and strains that, that we've had in orchards where we propagate those apples and we'll come up with a new variety every once in a while. The newest one, you know, recently here came from Washington state university in the cosmic crisp. And that's one of the new, you know, apples that's pretty sexy out there in the market. And cosmic crisp sounds cosmic a little crisp. bit like a children's cereal that would be like advertised on a Saturday morning cartoon to get your cosmic crisp and you get like a little plastic astronaut or something, you right. know, like when I was a kid, you had quisp and fro honeycomb, <laughs> all kinds. Why the hell do we eat that stuff? Anyway, yeah. um, first off, did the talk about the volatility though. We do have a tremendous amount of dollars invested per acre and then also the treatment, you know, to grow soybeans, I got the seed, I got the fertilizer, I go out there and spray it with glyphosate, let's just say, I, some other stuff now. But anyway, you're touching those apple trees a hell of a lot more, right, Mr. Dave? You're, you're, you got 10 full-time employees, and it's not that you're out there nuking them with chemistry all the time. What else are you doing? Well, today we, we have all 10 guys pruning, and, and I think that's what most people don't understand. We're, we prune all winter. It takes... Uh, you know, 70, 80, uh, even 100 hours an acre to prune. <laughs> so you multiply that times 120 acres. That is that is a tremendous amount. And then um, during bloom, we, we start the year during bloom and we watch real close and each, each little bud on an apple tree will have five flowers. So we try to use some chemicals to get those flowers down to one or two, if we let every apple tree uh, grow every single flower, they'd all be about as big as cherries. Okay, and, so you, you're eliminating, you, you use chemistry to eliminate uh, more than half of the flowers on an apple tree in the springtime. Oh yeah, 80 or 85% probably. And that's because you don't want the, every flower to become an apple because then the apple will be the you know too little. So you do that chemically is that was something that you fly over you you drive over or you got a guy with a backpack how are you doing this well we're doing it with a, a regular uh ground speed sprayer behind a tractor okay we uh everybody has a different technique i like to use uh three or or four different applications of fairly moderate rates of different chemicals depending on the stage of bloom it's in and then getting back to the guys um, 
We don't get it all done that way. We spend a tremendous amount of money hand thinning. My H-2A crew shows up about the 1st of June. And so we'll have all 24 guys out there for, you know, five or six weeks at least um, thinning those down <laughs> to a an ideal crop. Okay. Organic. Uh, Nate, you mentioned organic. What he just talked about doing just, and that's not talking about pesticides to get rid of bugs. It's not talking about getting rid of rusts and funguses and all that. He just talked about using a chemistry to get rid of flowers so we don't have too many apples and too small of apples per tree. What's the organic operator do? Actually, quite frankly, it's kind of ironic what Dave's talking about. That that process has been adapted into conventional as well. We're using lime sulfur and oil, which are are usually, you know, our lime sulfurs and oils are organic certified products. So Okay, so the organic, the organic people do spray product on there. It's just that it's approved. It is still a chemical. That is correct. And it's just that it's an organically approved chemical. Yeah, that's correct. It's it's uh, this isn't your Starbucks situation where you know you walk into Starbucks and everybody's like, oh, organic. Nothing gets ever sprayed on it. It's like no, there's there's organic pesticides and there's organic chemistry out there too. But the industry's adapted the organic approach uh, through the bloom time, like Dave's talking about, with like I said, this lime sulfur, lime sulfur and oils to come through. And really, what we're trying to do is caustically burn the fruit or the excuse me, the the flower part. We're trying to burn that so that it doesn't set the fruit on the on the end there. I see. Okay. The other thing we were talking about volatility, uh, Dave, can you insure, can I get a crop insurance on my apple trees? Yes, we do. Uh, get closer to the mic. Farm, a federal whole farm policy, just like most of the rest of agriculture in the U S I believe. So if I, if I, if I don't get a crop because uh, hellfire and, and brimstone, I don't get a crop. Does the government then guarantee me revenue so I can live to fight another season? Yep. Yep. Okay. It's adjusted gross revenue program. Okay. So you can do that. And and then the other part of it is going back to Nate um, on a, on a per acre, you probably roughly know what it is that he's going to gross off of honey crisps or goldens or whatever kind of, you know, galas, whatever that is. Um, are you involved in any way in, in that product other than just helping the tree along? Does, does a guy like you have anything to do with other than just, you, are you just tree and soil or do you, or do you have anything post crop? Yeah, no, no, we're not. We're, we're just tree and soil. We're in season. Um, most of the folks like Dave, they'll work with a, a packer facility or a grower packer shipper facility that actually will process that fruit and then market it and sell it for Dave. Um, it's an interesting concept because it's not like the row crop world. It's not a contract where you're, where you're set up, what you're working on is you're bringing in fruit. We are, we are indirectly uh, associated with that because we're always trying to help grow the right fruit, the right size, the right color. So, you know, between PGRs and some of the other products that we use, especially going back to the thinning that David PG, PGR, about. PGR, PGR. Yeah. Plant growth regulators. There so we're putting those in to actually enhance size when we're, when we're working on varieties that need more size. And then we're also using those uh, in the case of a red delicious specifically, pardon me, and some other stuff where we're actually trying to elongate that apple and actually make it longer rather than round. The American consumer on average, uh, you just dug up the numbers, eats 10 pounds of apples per year per American. Um, that's fresh. And then right. Dave used a number around 17 pounds. And we think we don't know for sure. We're going to look this up. So dear listener, if you want to look it up for me, that's fine. We think 17 pounds, that would constitute apple sauce, apple juice, apple cider, hard cider, uh, apple butter, apple jam, whatever. It's quite a bit. Um where do your apples go, Dave? Most most of the producers in Washington State, uh, seventy percent goes all over the United States, and the other thirty is marketed around the world. the The best market in the world is, in fact, the United States. I would love it if every single apple I grew was sold in the United States, but the the um, exports are so critical because you know I just takes the volume out of the country and and helps support prices um, literally everywhere in the world, more or less. And then of your splits of that 120 acres, tell me what varieties are on the, your, your apple acres. On apples, uh, 
I mentioned Honeycrisp. That's that's our by far our biggest product. We probably have uh, 35 acres. We grow uh, 20 acres of the Envy, uh, also a proprietary variety that brings very good money, and uh, 10 acres of Jazz apples. And our new one that we're really excited about is proprietary to proprietary to who is it to Robinson uh, Farms or to uh, the no, Washington Cooperative? It, in the case of Envy and Jazz, it's actually proprietary to a company out of uh, New Zealand. Oh, that we are a franchise grower for. Um, it's been a very successful business model with with that company, and they've done very good, very well. Um, honey crisp is, is open so everybody can plant it and man, have the prices changed on that in the last four or five years. Uh, but our, our personal one that we have through our local co-op is sugar bee and it's just coming into, uh, production and people are starting to see it around and, and you work my words now. Okay. I admitted it, it's, it's our personal one. I am more than excited about it. Uh, parents is honey crisp and we don't know the father, but um, it is a really, really good apple. You got, it's a, easier I mean, you, got a ba- you got a bastard child apple out there that is been a cross between honey crisp and some other random apples. What I'm hearing. Yep. That's, that's right. Sugar bee. And, and we're calling that, which what's the product that then the result is the sugar bee or is that something else? Yes. Okay. And that's okay. In my book, I talked about how we got so good at producing stuff that frankly, in agriculture, we, we prioritized transportation, durability, uh, and quantity over taste and nutrition. That's a true story. You can look at tomatoes. Unfortunately, I won't eat a store bought tomato. No, don't be not, not being mean. It just, it's just like water. Did we do that with apples? Because it seems to me apples are better now. We talked about honey crisp or a gala. I eat them. I'm like, damn, that's a good apple. Uh, Nate bashed on Golden Delicious. I like them. Uh, but did we get to where we just made Red Deliciouses that were great big and could travel and store really well, and they also didn't have a whole heck of a lot of flavor? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm afraid we did that. And and what about moving forward, Nate? Your take? Yeah, I, I think so. And and ironically, you you know, mentioned the golden. Golden's still my favorite apple. I, I love a golden delicious that's that's been grown correctly and, and picked correctly. But the problem is, like I'd said before, you know, it, it's got to be redder. It's got to be sweeter. It's got to have that. It's got to have those tastes. It's got to have that. A red delicious apple does not taste like a cosmic crisp. It does not taste like a sugar bee. Sugar bee is a fantastic apple. Um, these club varieties that Dave's talking about and the stuff he's growing, he's growing a lot of apples that have a tremendous amount of flavor and they've, they've definitely, they definitely hit the marketplace and they appeal to the, to the average consumer. You talked about compliance and we said to our, we're at our beginning, because we're going to be wrapping up here a little bit. What's the compliance? Um, you know, I want to grow, uh, I want to grow some sheep out here. I don't need anybody coming around and making sure I'm governed compliance. What are we complying on? What's going on? What's uh, what sort of rules and regulations are we adhering to to make sure that your apples can go to a grocery store or a food service? Fairly mind boggling, uh, at least in my opinion. <laughs> we we have been certified with Global Gap in the past. Uh, our local co op helps us with that. Wilbur Ellis has a program to help with that and it includes everything from um, certifying that we've cleaned all our equipment before harvest we have designated areas for our employees to uh, eat we um, well we don't have the old outhouses anymore you know we uh-huh. have portable toilets that that need to be cleaned on a regular basis and that's part off. that's part of the deal you bet. And and that here here's a funny one that I think is funny. Not only is the toilet there and we're cleaning it and we're we're following the paperwork on that, but then we have a hand washing facility there, which makes sense. But then the water from the hand washing facility is not supposed to be dumped on the ground. Huh. Um, I really don't know where you're supposed to dump it. We we just dump it down the toilet, I'll tell you now. But um it's some of this stuff is over the top. There's there's even been 
times. Well, there there are some certification bodies that would like us to record the the animals in the orchards, and um, it's it's just a little much. I told you about the fire we had here. Well, we we had to get after we got our irrigation up, we had to put our deer fence back in, but everything around our home place is black and and the pressure from the deer is just tremendous the the bears dig under the new fence we put up and that allows the deer to get in um are they hurting the apples well i don't think so are they hurting the apple trees oh yeah they sure do the deer damn it deer deer get in and tear up your trees the bears get in there to eat the apples you know, my only problem with bears is that they dig the holes under the fence so the deer can get in. The, the bears will get up in the tree, but they just don't do that much damage. The mamas will get up, bang on a limb, and knock the fruit off. They really like pears. But, <laughs> but the deer the, the deer eat the buds for the next year. Yeah, and that's and bad. So that, that's that, a different that, story. That, that cuts in your production. Compliance that you have to be involved in, Nate, because is it uh, proper handling of the, the pesticides and things like that? Yeah, we, we actually, all of our field staff have to be certified to be able to write recommendations. So part of our compliance, we have to give a reason for why we suggest that Dave sprays something because we've observed that in the field. Uh Um, Organic side of certification, a lot more uh, hurdles than there used to be. Uh We have to give nutrient uh, recommendations. We have to show deficiencies to be able to quantify that we need to add something to it. Um, And then we do, you know, the industry's changed since I started 32 years ago. It used to be a pad and pencil and you wrote down what you needed to do. Now everything's electronically kept. We have laptops in the trucks. These guys write recommendations and they, they can label check while they're, you know, on the, on the laptop, as long as they have Wi-Fi where they're at, or they have internet connection, but we have to go through, we do a lot of monitoring of, of rates of products so that we're within label tolerances. We do a lot of MRL, so maximum residue levels have to be taken in consideration with products. Um, as we export this food, or even in import cases, we have to make sure that we take care of what we put on and, and that we're within the tolerances and within the rates that we can use. So we do a lot of that with our field staff and with our compliance team working on, on labels and, and the amounts and the rates of the products that we can use. And then those MRLs get tough because not every country has the same MRL. So mm-hmm. if we're shipping apples to China, it's one thing. If we're shipping apples or cherries, pick a commodity to another country, the MRL isn't the same. So you got to know how you have that and what you've put on and, and when you put it on. Dave, that's, that's good information. So that's the big question here. There's a lot of money invested. You got a lot of hands on, uh, and it, God knows you're also fighting the bears and the deer. Did you make money in 2021? 2021 crop we just finished picking about six weeks ago. So, so another interesting thing about tree fruit, I, I won't know if I made money on that crop until um, next November. Um, on the 2020 crop for for Robinson Orchards, it was just nip and tuck. Um, I like to say if it's a range within five or ten percent, because I'm not a perfect bookkeeper, that what we did is on 2020 we broke even. <laughs> I am hoping for a lot more in 21, but I'll tell you this: I, I went through our varieties, and we don't have any reds or goldens or or Galas or Fuji's or Granny Smith, which is kind of unusual. Um, but because we don't have those, we have an awful lot of trees that aren't producing yet. So we're, it, it is, it's very, very tight. Um, we decided to do that. Let me just tell you a little story. About 10 years ago, we had reds and we truly are in this area historically famous for um, the quality of our red delicious. At the same time, our earliest Honeycrisp blocks were coming into production. And we had a couple of years, let's say the cost of production at the time was $150 for that bin of apples, that thousand pound bin. And our reds returned 80 to 100 and our Honeycrisp were returning 700 to 800 dollars a bin. You said, 70 or 80 bucks versus 800? Seven or 800. Yes. Ten now, t- the ten price times of more? Honey's have, what's that? 10 times the amount difference? Yes. 
the price of honeys have come down. If they wouldn't have come down, I wouldn't be talking to you because I'd be retired. <laughs> uh so here's the thing you said, you won't know if you made any money until a year from now. Uh, you, your, your crop is picked. It is at a warehouse. It's being washed, packaged, whatever that thing should be shipped. I mean, the perishable stuff. How long does an apple last? A few months? Uh, no, 12 months. We, you know, I say it lasts 12 months because we need to get rid of the old ones before the new ones come on. But we can keep it. We can keep it. We can keep a fresh apple refrigerated, and it'll be good for a year. Yes, yes. It's more common for the max to be like eleven months again because uh -huh. of that new crop. But we use controlled atmosphere storage. Yep. Um, it's so, not just a cold room. Right. There's also oxygen and things like that uh, are right. fixed. Okay, so it doesn't break down. Uh, but why don't you know? Why don't you know what you're making? Because that's in the hands of a of a middle guy, and then you don't get paid until uh, it's all sold. We almost all take our fruit to a, a warehouse that um, packs and stores and and often sells, uh -huh. and we'll get an estimate of the value of the 2021 crop. For for our local co-op, but but things change tremendously through the year. So at, from January on, we'll we'll get a percent of what they're estimating those apples are worth each month until um, the last of them get sold the next November. You know, twelve months later. Right. So you don't get paid when do you, do you have to all get, do you get paid all at once or do you have to, are you getting paid all along? A little bit all along. Okay. From January on. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you, you may not actually be, you know, you may not actually be knowing whether your net profit until somewhere toward, uh, <laughs> toward the end of that whole cycle. Yeah. All right. Um, we've been on here a long time talking about a fascinating industry. Uh, I got Nate Squires with Will Ellis. He's the horticultural specialist. I got Dave Robinson of Robinson Farms. If you want to find more information from Mr. Robinson, uh, where do they go? Send him an email, right? Yeah. Email will be good. D.B. Robinson. That's which one B. D.B.R.O.B.I.S.O.N. 43, the number at gmail.com. And uh, he'd love to hear from you. Um, I, I hope you do make money, by the way. Yeah, you too, right? You too. All right, Nate, thanks for being here. A reminder to uh, the listeners and viewers that are in apple country or in any tree fruit business in Washington state, I'm going to be at the tree fruit conference in Yakima, Washington, speaking on the morning of January 4th. Nate's going to be there. My man Dave's going to be there. They're going to talk about fruit. I'm going to talk about the big picture of American agriculture, marketplace, outlook, insights, competition, regulation, legislation, and consumer changes, as well as demographics, all the stuff that is impacting our industry. All right. My name is Damian Mason. These guys, thanks for being here. It's the business of agriculture. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thank you. You bet. Until next time. This episode of the business of agriculture was brought to you by Land Trust. Landowners, just like you, are increasing profitability by adding recreation to their portfolio of land use. Millions of recreators actively seek wide open spaces for bird watching, photography, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, and many other farm and ranch activities. Owners of farm and ranch properties are partnering with Recreation Access Network Land Trust. Land Trust is an online platform connecting recreators with landowners for outdoor experiences on their land to increase profitability. Visit LandTrust.com slash BOA, as in Business of Agriculture, to learn more. That's LandTrust.com slash BOA.